Fantastic. Okay, so like I said, so today we are going to be looking a little bit more around the Responsible Leaders Fellowship, and um, that is for, well, it's not just for MBA students, but it is most commonly taken up by MBA students. So I will start with an introduction to the school, ESMT Berlin, and also to the full-time MBA before we get to the, uh, the RLF Q&A. So who are ESMT Berlin? Now, um, for those who don't know, the, uh, the shiny sort of building facade on the right-hand side, that's our building. Uh, that's our front door. And I'm currently on campus at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm actually uh, in that building, but uh, over towards the, the, the left-hand side. Uh, and if you're interested in, in figuring out where we are in relation to the rest of Berlin, um, we're basically uh, at the bottom of the, the tall pointy thing on the left-hand side. So that's, uh, that's the TV tower that basically signifies that somewhere is right in the center of Berlin and that's uh, that's where we are so if you do end up studying with us um, you can pretty much choose where you want to live in Berlin because you will be nowhere more than about half an hour away from from the campus um, but we're not here by accident so the, the school itself was um, was founded in Berlin because it was uh, an up-and-coming uh, city in Europe both um, economically as well as politically. So the school itself was founded in 2002 by this group of 25 multinational corporations. And essentially, they decided that the, the, the graduates they were getting from other business schools didn't quite cut the mustard, they didn't quite have the skills that, uh, that they were looking for. So they thought, right, let's cut out the middleman uh, and do this ourselves. So that was where the school came from. Now, obviously, we began by uh, offering programs just to the employees of these companies. Since then, we've expanded out, we now have a range of different postgraduate programs as well as short courses as well um, but it's nice to know that we still have those sort of connections with those uh, with those companies now um, I probably I get in trouble if I talk about those founding companies too much because obviously just because you study with us does not mean you get to go and be the CEO of McKinsey after you graduate um, but they do still you know uh, provide sort of feedback to the school they are still involved in the school and the lives of the students to a greater or, or lesser extent the most important of which probably is, is through feedback so they're able to let us know when they see a skills shortage in the market so they can then tell us you know we're struggling to recruit students with with these skills and we can then change our curriculum so that our students are sort of some of the first to um to hit the market with those skills. And you'll probably see that with the curriculum of the full-time MBA when we get to that point. Now, the school was founded on these three key pillars. So leadership, innovation, and analytics. And that's hopefully something that you should see cropping up again and again throughout all of our programs. <clears throat> Now, we always say that uh, there are a million more important reasons to choose a business school than rankings. There's definitely um, uh, there's definitely other things to consider as well, but they can be a sort of helpful guide when it comes to sort of placing a school amongst its contemporaries. And we're, we're quite proud of the rankings that we received recently. So for the last three years, the Financial Times has ranked us as the number one business school in, uh, in Germany. And um, two years, we were number nine in Europe, and last year we got bumped up to number seven, so that's very nice. Um, more importantly, probably, is uh, the thing you can see on the right-hand side of your screen here, which is our accreditation. So accreditation, what that means is that there are these sort of bodies around the world who go around verifying degrees at business schools, um, and we are one of around 100 schools in the world that have this uh, triple crown accreditation. Now, what that means is that um, uh, these uh, we have accreditation from all of these three, AACSB, AMBA, and Equus, as well as the German accreditation body. Uh, but what that means is that wherever you end up in the world, wherever your degree takes you around the world, your degree will be recognized. Now, uh, the program that we are all here to learn a bit more about today, which is the uh, full-time MBA. Now, this is um, a program that's designed for those who are interested fundamentally in making a change. Now, there is a minimum work experience requirement of about three years. Uh, well, not about three years, exactly three years. You need to have three years of post-graduation work experience, but the average work experience is about seven or eight years. So, um, you know, there are some super hot shop 27 year olds in the class who have three or four years work experience. And there are some people in the class who have up to 10 or 15 years of work experience, but the average person has around seven or eight years of work experience. So it's already a pretty significant career that they've had, um, but they're looking to make a change. They're looking to take that step up to more senior positions. Perhaps you've come from a technical field, like something like engineering, um, 
And now you're looking at taking on managerial positions within those uh, within that field. So a full time MBA would give you the sort of broader business skills to to take on those uh, to take on those those roles, whilst also providing the leverage um, able to change either your industry, your role, and location. Now every single one of our students will change at least one of those things. Uh, most of our students will change two of those things, and there are a few hotshots who will change all three at the same time. So for example, industry you would move say from uh, higher education to finance uh, role, you would say take on a, a more senior management position and location, say you would take on uh, a position in Germany rather than in your home country. Now that's something that we'll get onto a, a bit in a moment um, is the sort of relocation part of the program. But for now, the uh, the curriculum. Now you mentioned, I mentioned earlier that the sort of um, the founder companies were very good at sort of feeding back to us the uh, the skill shortages that they saw in the market, and that's why we have our specialisations available on the full time program. Now, the first curriculum specialisation is managerial analytics. Obviously, it's quite numbers heavy. It's more data focused. It's for those who don't necessarily want to become an analyst, but they do want to manage teams of analysts, or they do want to be the link between uh, a technical side of a business and the rest of the organisation. The second is innovation and entrepreneurship, and, and similar to analytics, the expectation isn't necessarily that you would be, uh, you know, you would have to go and start your own company after you graduated, although some people do. But the idea is that you would learn to work in a sort of nascent industry, a, a, a company that's growing very, very rapidly, a company that has to change the way it does things very, very quickly. Um, that's where the, the focus of innovation and entrepreneurship comes through. And then finally, we have strategic leadership. And now this is the more sort of traditional uh, MBA uh, approach. This is designed to teach you how to work within large organizations for those who are interested in moving to the roles like uh, consulting, strategy, those sort of things. This is where strategic leadership really kind of comes into its own. Now, there's, uh, that's what you'll learn as part of the curriculum. But to be honest, a lot of the value of the program comes from the time that you spend outside of the classroom. Now, for uh, our 15 month program, there is a lot of customization that's been built in. It's not just around the, the curriculum. You can also choose to take advantage of some of our other summer and sort of uh, projects um, uh, projects that are available to, to candidates to help sort of customize your, your education so that you can sort of steer yourself in the, in the right direction. Now, in the sort of summer break, as it were, between, between the two sort of breaks of of, uh, of seven months of, uh, of teaching, there are a few different options available. So an internship. So for example, those who are interested in changing their location, if you're interested in coming to Germany and, and working in Berlin, this is a really good opportunity to dip your toe into the local employment market to gain some really valuable uh, networking opportunities uh, as well as sort of um, perhaps try your hand out at a different industry. Uh, there's also a social impact challenge. Now this is a bit like the RLF, but we'll talk about that more today, so I won't um, go on about it too much. For those who are interested in, in settling in Germany long-term, we do have an intensive German op opportunity as well. This is a six week intensive full-time German. Uh, so you do really get the opportunity to, to practice. Um, we also have the summer entrepreneurship program. So for example, those who are perhaps interested in, um, in starting their own company or developing their own idea, then you can get access to our incubator. It's called Valley Berlin. Uh, and it's uh, in partnership with the university. It's here to help um, graduates to develop their own uh, to develop their own ideas. There's also international exchange options. There's also after you graduate the RLF, uh, and there's also multiple elective options. So the idea is that within the 15 months, you have maximum opportunity to uh, change and customize the uh, curriculum to suit your needs. Now the thing to the other thing to mention here is our class profile. Now our classes aren't very large. We we accept somewhere between. 40, 50, 60 students across our different kinds of MBAs every year. Um, and that's by design. We anticipate, we see that it's better to have uh, not necessarily the broadest network, but definitely the deepest. So every other single person on the on the cohort, on the class, uh, you will have worked with at some point, whether that's in a project or you'll have sat next to them in a class or whatever it is, you will have had that opportunity to work with and network with every other person in that class. Um, so it is hopefully a very, very tight knit group of people. 
It's also worth pointing out that we have a very international student body. So we actively recruit students from, from all around the world, from outside of Germany. Um, you can see here that nearly 90% of our students are non-Germans. And within our class of 41 students, we have 21 different nationalities represented. So it's a very, very diverse group. And again, you are going to work with every single person in that group a lot. So I hope you're, you're ready to take part in, for example, a group activity where you know, if, if you, like me, came from the UK, you would be in a group with someone from Germany, someone from America, someone from Latin America, someone from India, someone from the Middle East. You know, you would have to be prepared for that very diverse environment. The other thing to highlight here is our uh, gender ratio. So we've been working quite hard on our gender ratio recently, and we're really proud this year that we've really very close to achieving parity, um, uh, really very close to achieving 50-50. Um, but either way, it is something that we do actively look for. And, and if you are interested in, in learning a bit more about that, then there's a bit more information on the website about how we sort of encourage that. So uh, that's all well and good. You know, you'll get up to lots of uh, interesting and, and fun stuff whilst you're here. But we do recognize that fundamentally, the reason that one comes to business school is to improve your career. So in that end, we do have a dedicated team of career service professionals, and it's essentially their job to help with your job. So um, obviously it's a full-time program, so we do expect students not to work whilst they're studying with us. We have part-time and online programs for those who want to continue to work. Um, but for a full-time program, there is a hard deadline, there is a hard drop-off at the end of those 15 months when you're back out into the employment market. So that's really where the career services team uh, come in is making sure that that first step is right, but also so that the, the next few steps are right as well. So we almost call it sort of like a career therapy to make sure that you're on the right path, not just for five years, but also for 10 years and 20 years down the line. They can do that through one of sort of two ways, really. So the first is through working on yourself. So as I said, that's sort of individual guidance, career therapy, but also personal branding and uh, strength finders, identifying your strengths and weaknesses and what you like and what you don't, all of that sort of stuff to make sure that you are making the right decisions. And then through networking, so to make sure that you are able to make the decisions that, that work. So bringing companies to you and bringing you to companies through things like company presentations and the career fair on campus. Um, obviously, we have very, very strong links to our founder companies, but also we are based in Berlin, which is probably the largest startup economy in Europe at the moment. Uh, and so we do draw quite heavily on that sort of startup world. And this is the result. So um, these are uh, figures that are sort of representative of where people kind of end up with our, with, uh, as a result of our career service work. Um, now it's worth pointing out that these are averages, obviously, so there's no guarantee that your starting salary will be 83,000 euros when you do study with us, but um, that's where most people will end up. The, um, the most important thing to highlight here, I think, is that um, it's the 88% uh, of our graduates who are now working in Germany. Now, uh, you probably saw earlier, um, that around 90% of our graduates are non-German and around 90% will stay to work in Germany. So um, you can see that a lot of our students will stick around to work in Germany, even though they're not German nationals. Uh, we're very fortunate in that regard. So the German government are very, very keen to keep their graduates in the country. So uh, everybody who graduates from our program is given an 18 month work visa, uh, which basically gives you the rights of a citizen, really. You can come and go as you please. You can uh, pick up or put down jobs as you please. Um, and you can also sort of see where our students tend to end up. So technology and consulting are obviously big ones. Technology, I think that sort of taps into the sort of startup economy here as well. Uh, but there's also you know, a wide variety of others as well. Oh. Lovely stuff. So uh, if that all sounds good, if that sounds interesting and you are interested in learning a bit more, um, I would recommend going to the website as a, as a sort of full documentation of all of our uh, admission steps, because there is a lot and there is a lot of things you have to bear in mind. But just to sort of run you through how this all works. So once you've gathered all your documents together, um, you can then hit submit on your application and you'll be invited to a personal interview. Now, this interview is very important for us, I think, because as I said before, the classes aren't enormous. There's not, um, it's not a huge amount of people that you'll be in class with. So it only takes one or two people with the wrong sort of attitude to spoil that experience for everybody else. And so what we want are students who are going to really work well with the rest of the group. So students who are going to be collaborative rather than competitive. Now, obviously, it's a business school. Everyone's a bit competitive anyway. Um, 
but we do want people who are going to work to make sure that everyone in their group succeeds rather than just saying oh no forget you guys i only really care about my own grade um obviously there's a like i said a big long list of required documents uh, but for those who are interested in applying for the mba that begins in january 2023 in that sense uh there is uh, a few admissions deadlines to pay attention to so the way that we've structured our admissions this year and this is a, a new thing for this year is that we have uh, seven admissions rounds and each one of these rounds has a few different criteria attached to it uh, the good thing is that we are early enough in the year that uh, there are still tuition, automatic tuition discounts being attached to these tuition rounds. Um, the round two application deadline is today, actually, is March the 30th. So if you are interested and you are uh, pretty close to submitting your application, I would make sure to get it in before midnight tonight because you will get an automatic two and a half thousand euro discount from your tuition. Uh, for those who are a bit later in their, in their journey, then obviously the rest of the uh, rounds are worth paying attention to. But the next after this will be May 18th. Okay, so uh, the reason that we're here to talk about today is uh, the Responsible Leaders Fellowship. Now, I won't talk about this too much because I will leave this up to our guest number two, too, but essentially the RLF takes place after you graduate. You can choose to sort of extend your studenthood, as it were, by, uh, uh, by picking up a project that um, supports uh, a, 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 country, uh, a company or, or a social sort of uh, venture that helps to improve people's lives in a developing country. Now, there's a big long list of the different uh, uh, RLFs that have been done recently on the, on the right hand side here, but really it's an opportunity to take what it is that you've learned over the previous 12 or 13 or 15 months and apply it in a situation that really, really helps people. And uh, Speaking of, I think that's probably a good time for me to uh, stop talking and I would like to uh, invite Nabatutu. I'm going to promote you to a panelist and then I'm going to promote you to a co-host and then we can crack on with the Q&A. So I mentioned earlier that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to type them into there. Uh, anything that's sort of admissions or school-based, I think I can probably handle, but anything that's about the, the program and the experience, and especially the RLF, then uh, we'll put that to, to Navatutu. So hi Navatutu, thanks very much for coming along. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for having me, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, yeah, so I guess before we sort of start with the Q&A, do you maybe want to, to introduce yourself quickly and tell us a bit more about, uh, about how you ended up at ESMT and, and how you've ended up on this, on this project? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I actually heard about ESMT from um, alumni uh, from the class of 2018, and uh, they were doing their RLF project here in Kenya. So that's actually how I got to learn about RLF and I was sold on doing it before even joining the program. Um, for me, I was sold because of the location and exactly how the program was structured. Um, I wanted something that was a bit compressed so that it could get back into the market. Yeah, so that's how I landed in ESMT, yeah. That's very cool. I didn't realize that it was the project that came first. So you've, <laughs> you've always known, I guess, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. it was a project that came past. And currently I'm in Kigali uh, doing my RLF with an organization called Industry Margin Africa. Uh, they're pretty much focused on like fostering STEM graduates' employability on the continent. And yeah, I'm supporting the program director to like sort of work on a few projects uh, that I'll share in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about, I mean, how did you find the project? I mean, um, you're obviously, you're not from Kigali. I mean, um, did you already know people in the area that you could sort of tap up for projects like this? Or, or did you go to the school first and then they point you in the direction of people? Actually, initially I was trying to source my own project. So I reached out to FSC. They do forestry certification, um, but their project was to be based in Asia and I wanted something on the continent. So when that didn't work out, I reached out to Nick, who's like the custodian of the RLF program. And uh, he kept, uh, so he sort of introduced me to two contacts uh, that had projects, one in healthcare and another one in edutech. And uh, I was leaning more towards the EduTech project. So I reached out to the organization, had an interview with the program director and yeah, it all worked out and uh, here I am. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Oh, it's really cool. Um, uh, we actually, we have a question that's come through already. So uh, thank you, Fanindra, um, who asks, uh, what kind of percentage of students end up doing this project? I mean, uh, you're from a class of, I want to say about 50, I think. I'm correct yeah, to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, are, are you alone in doing this project or has most of your uh, fellow colleagues done it as well? Uh, yeah, a lot of the uh, fellows did it this year. Actually, I'm told this is the highest number we've had in history. So we have 13 out of 50 students doing the fellowship. Um, eight are based in Africa, so that's exciting. Uh, yeah, so it's a good percentage. That's about um, 13 of 50. That's, that's a test of your mental, uh, mental arithmetic. <laughs> yeah, yes, but 13 from 50, I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. um, do you know of many of your colleagues who are, are they based nearby to you or are they sort of scattered around the continent? Um, three are in East Africa. So actually last weekend I was home. So I met three that are in, in Kenya and um, three are in South Africa, which is a bit far. And yeah, so they're not very far from each other and people are doing stuff together. So that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So could you maybe talk us through what the sort of day-to-day -day looks like with your project? Um, because I, I know that sort of for some people, the idea of flying in, being a consultant for a bit, and then flying back out again might be a bit sort of challenging, I suppose. So um, what does your sort of project hope to achieve in the sense that, you know, uh, what kind of expertise can, can you bring to it? Yeah, so I'll be based in Kigali for three months. And uh, what I'm majorly uh, working on at the moment is uh, sort of a fundraising strategy for the organization. Uh, so just documentation of the program strategy so that the, um, the director can have like the proper decks to use in fundraising when speaking to donors that he has in mind. Um, aside from that, I'm also supporting for ad uh, student admissions. So this week and next week we are doing uh, admissions for this uh, coming intake that starts in July. Um, yeah, so those are my two major tasks, but because I'm also based in a, on a campus, a lot of like uh, administrative tasks come in, like supporting students uh, for like career services stuff, like um, uh, networking events and building CVs and stuff like that. So it's exciting. It's been like a bit of everything, but <laughs> things that I love doing. So <laughs> I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. And so did you have very much experience in, for example, fundraising before you went and did this project or are you sort of coming coming new to that? It's quite new. I worked in an NGO for my first job, but honestly, it was not in fundraising. So I'm learning a lot on the job, but also I think uh, the MBA program prepared me in some sense. Uh, for this. Uh, like there's a lot of like frameworks we learned, especially in the uh, business strategy modules, like for NGOs and stuff like that. So I'm sort of recapitulating a lot of like experiences from the MBA program and uh, applying it right now. But I didn't have like prior experience in fundraising and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's really that's really nice to know, nice to hear that um, that you're yeah. able to apply that learning so immediately. That is really um, that's really positive. Is there for, is there like one class that sort of stands out as being sort of most helpful in that respect? Yeah, I would say Professor Chingwei's uh, corporate strategy class. Uh, a lot of the frameworks that we learned, like Porter's five forces, uh, personal analysis, have been really helpful. Uh, I've also found myself like um, applying a lot of like uh, Professor Henry's class. We had a module on uh, business strategy and how it's applicable for NGOs, like building the business model canvases for NGOs. So that has really been helpful and. Yeah, I'm hoping there's more to learn uh, and apply from uh, the MBA experience in general. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, it's yeah, it's very, very positive. All of these experiences kind of adds up. And I suppose being based on a on a campus, being based at a school, um, there's also presumably there's lots of extra stuff that you would have picked up while studying here that you can yeah. help apply, like you said, with admissions in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Um, and so I guess uh, another question would be, so I know for a lot of people, the idea of, traveling halfway around the world and, and doing something like this in a very different environment might be quite challenging. Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose, how have you found the, the change in environments? Um, I guess coming from Kenya to Berlin and then also from Berlin to Kigali. Yeah, um, 
one has a lot to do with the culture aspect of it. So I'm from East Africa. I thought Rwanda would be very close or similar to Kenya. But to my surprise, people are quite different, very conservative and less expressive, if I might say it like that. Um, quite close to the German culture. <laughs> so I was like, I spent the one year in Berlin. It sort of prepared me for that. Uh, but in general, I would say like, the infrastructure in Rwanda is really developed. Like I did a, a, lo a road trip um, a couple of weeks ago with a friend and the roads were amazing. The terrain is beautiful uh, with a lot of like tea landscapes and everything. Um, so I would say it has had a lot of positives and uh, negatives, but so far really nothing major to complain about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's very that's really good well you mentioned positives and negatives so i, I guess now's a, a good time so um i guess let's start on the negatives they're the bad bit um mm -hmm. what what do you think has been like the most challenging part of the of the project for you so far what has been the most challenging part of the project um yeah i, I guess it has a lot to do with the covid restrictions um you will pretty much need a PCR test to do anything here in Kigali <laughs> on your own cost. So that has not been fun. Uh, another thing is like for the project I'm working on, uh, the core team is based in Cape Town uh, in South Africa. So it feels a lot more like uh, I'm working remotely with a team uh, that is in Cape Town. But yeah, I'm balancing it out. Uh, I, want, I really wanted to be in Rwanda uh, and that's why I didn't pick South Africa, but uh, that's the only challenge. But yeah, it's working out so far. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, there's a, another question here from uh, uh, Fanidra, so I can probably answer this. So um, yes, uh, the RLF is something that takes place after you finish your uh, conventional 12 or 15 months studying with us. So it would have been 12 months for Nabajuju, but for the for the new class, it's 15. So um, what you do is, whereas normally you would uh, graduate in that sense, uh, and you'd have your graduation ceremony, um, you will continue as a student. Uh, we call you a, a student for visa wise for the time that you're doing the RLF. And then you officially graduate when you finish your project. Um, so Nabajuju, I don't know if you've found this already but did you already have a, a graduation ceremony before you set off for your project already yes so we did the ceremony with everyone else had friends and family over but we don't get the certificate because you need to finish the project before you are given the, your degree yeah okay yeah. fantastic and then that would be the point at which your post-graduation visa for Germany will kick in. Um, so yeah, are you are you planning on sort of returning to Berlin after after the project to, to continue working in Europe? Yeah, uh, I'm coming back to Germany in May. Um, I have a few things going on in the pipeline and I'm excited to start uh, my career right after this. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. And uh, do you do you have you say you have a few things in the pipeline, but is um for, is there something that you're aiming for, like an industry or a particular kind of role? Or? Yes, um, as you mentioned, uh, Berlin is big on fintech, so right now it's a lot of the fintechs. Um, and then there is a sports brand. Um, so like th those are my two main uh, nice. industries that I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. And and so for your classmates who. Uh, who didn't pursue the the program who've sort of jumped straight into work uh, have you sort of caught up with them are you aware of um any of the sort of experiences that they're having moving straight into work i mean are they enjoying that yeah uh, i think they're enjoying that uh, but to be honest i've caught up a lot with people doing the project like the fellowship as opposed to uh those jumping into the ma job market uh but so far for the few that i've talked to they're really having a good time um most of them are actually in Berlin, so I'm excited to go back and still have friends when I go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So for, for Nidra, I hope that sort of answers your question. This is this is just an optional extra for the uh, for the program. This is something that we kind of add on the end for those who are interested in sort of, yeah, like I said, sort of taking the opportunity to, to do something a bit different before they before they uh, move back into the into the world of work, as it were. Um, so now, but yeah, so sorry, we got distracted from our actual project there. So, um, do you have any sort of specific uh, aims or things that you sort of hope to achieve whilst you're out uh, in Kigali? Is there like an end point to you for this project for you, or is it just sort of see how far you get with things? 
uh, it's quite open for now. Uh, and the project is always set in that sense because they know things can happen. You can get your dream job before you finish the project or something. Uh, and so for me, like, I just have the main goals to like sort of figure out the documentation of the strategy uh, paper or rather dig. And then um, besides that, uh, for the projects, I think it's really like going to just go with the flow, see how things go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and what have you enjoyed most about it so far? What's been the most um, sort of pleasant experience for you so far? Well, I'll be biased. <laughs> <laughs> for me, like just coming back to Kigali was amazing because I'm back home after a whole year. But I would say my highlight was actually the road trip that I did. I did it with a friend from the MBA cohort. Um, and um, another major highlight is um, hosting like the International Women's Day, uh, beginning of March. Uh, we did it at the center with a lot of like Rwandan dignitaries and I was part of the panel. So that was really exciting, uh, just seeing how the young girls were excited about it. Um, yeah, I think those have been my major highlights uh, for the fellowship so far. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, so it's not all work. You do get to sort of get out and, and sort of explore the local area a bit and do some sort of sightseeing yeah. in that sense. And network as well. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. really exciting for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Actually, that must have been a tremendous boost for your network um, to be able to take yeah. part in an event like that. How did how did they get in touch with you, or did you sort of get in touch with them? Uh, so we were thinking of hosting an International Women's Day when I arrived uh, for the fellowship. Um. And then the center president had an idea of just reaching out to a few contacts, but they were also thinking of hosting one as, uh, okay, Rwanda is very big on gender uh, equality and stuff like that. So we decided to match the two events and it ended up just being one big event for the two uh, parties. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Nice, okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, so keep your questions coming for number two. I think we've had uh, a few so far, but we definitely got time for uh, for a couple more. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask number two about uh, other projects. Obviously, you kind of looked into a couple of different ones, but um, do you know, are there sort of restrictions on the kind of project that people can pursue? I mean, does it have to be, for example, a social enterprise or or could it be a business as well or, you know, a, you know education? Um, you know, are there restrictions on that sort of thing? Uh, the only restriction that um, I'm aware of, it, it has to have a social impact. It could be in an NGO, in a startup, in corporate. Uh, I know someone who's working for a big marketing agency in South Africa, but they're doing a project that is sort of like uh, elevating uh, the youth's livelihoods in Cape Town. So uh, it is very like important that it, it has a social impact irrespective of the industry. And then the school approves the project and then um, you have the go ahead to like start the project. Yeah. Cool. So it's quite open, I suppose, in that sense, you know, as long as it, yeah. as long as you can prove it's, it's value. All right, that's good to know. Um, cool, so there's there's a question that's come here through from uh, from uh, Divya, who asks, um, for you specifically, um, have you, or, I mean, you've already sort of touched on it a little bit, that you've already sort of started thinking about what you'll do after the project ends. Um, so have you been, for example, have you been researching whilst you're out there, or are you focused entirely on the project while you're out there, and then you'll deal with employment when you get back to uh, Berlin? I think it's different for people. My, my case is like um, interviewing as I work on the project, uh, because they want to be working right when I come back. Uh, but I know people who are really like just focusing on the project, and they will figure out things when they come back. So I guess it's yeah, individual for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's true, sort of personal preference, I guess. Yes, it's true. I suppose for some people, uh, they can kind of afford to focus on this and then deal with it when they come back. But yeah. I guess you you, you want to, to hit the ground running when you come back to, yeah. to Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, so you mentioned uh, the, the impact of Corona earlier, uh, which I guess is the big... Uh, the big elephant in the room um as, so aside from obviously the restrictions like you said um uh, at the time did it have an impact on your thinking about when you were going to do the project um you know uh were you sort of put off by any potential restrictions or, or were you sort of determined to, to go ahead and, and do it anyway um to be honest i was really set on doing the project i remember even during uh the mba program because of the networking events they are like job opportunities that come up in between, and I really wanted to do this. So for those that couldn't wait, uh, I didn't want to sort of like put this on hold for that. 
uh, but I was determined to do it whether in person or online. And uh, I don't think that really had a big impact on my decision on whether to do it or not. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And so it was, it is possible to do the project remotely then? So people could do it yes. online? Yeah, you can do it online from Berlin, just that the terms uh, do change because they give you like a stipend and stuff like that. So those are the nitty gritties that will change based mm -hmm. on whether you're in country or you're in Berlin. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I guess for those who are interested in maybe doing one remotely, it's important to make sure that the time zone works and, and all of that sort yeah. of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's nice to know though, because I know there are students on the master's program so when they do their social impact project which is sort of broadly similar but it's slightly different um there are students who choose to do it remotely because they you know cuts down on their carbon footprint from flying and all that sort of stuff so um you know it's nice to know that there's that flexibility there uh cool all right well it seems like we've kind of come to the end of the questions from our audience so um you know we can sort of wrap it up a little early that's fine we can save ourselves another 10 minutes that's uh, that's really no problem um but i actually have one kind of final question for you never so uh, from your experience so far um of doing the mba and then you know taking on this amazing project um if you could give sort of one top tip to uh, to a prospective student, someone perhaps who's about to start the program, about how to sort of really make the most of it and how to sort of succeed um, as best they can uh, on the RLF, uh, what what would that be? Uh, how to succeed on RLF? Um, I've sort of thrown this one at you. I'm afraid I didn't give you any uh, <laughs> advance warning. <I'm> <laughs> No, I would say really like go for what you want because like um, some people are going are using RLF as an avenue to make a career shift, and this is the best chance because you don't have the pressure like to sort of like make an income from your uh, performance on the job and something of the sort. So I would say like uh, find a project that you really you really care about, whether it's going to help you make a career transition or just for like uh, personal gratification. Um, I think that would be like my one advice um, and how to really succeed. I think just immerse yourself in, in the culture and you will have a good time in whichever country you are, because that's the only way you also have fun with uh, within the people around you. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I think it's a really lovely point, actually, to, to make sure that you do sort of throw yourself into it you know 100 yeah. percent because you're right it's a it's really the only way to to really maximize it um fantastic all right well thank you so much for for joining us today we won't keep you any longer um and uh, for those of you who who are interested in learning a little bit more then we do have a variety of other online events happening uh, over the next months uh, we also have a few events happening in person in berlin happily hooray for the first time in a in a few years um so you can find more information uh, on the website. And if you do want to connect with either of us, then um, uh, I can share my screen now and that will have some uh, contact information. Uh, so admissions.degrees at esmt.org and, and that phone number, that comes right through to our office. So, so if uh, perhaps you didn't get a chance to, to ask your question today or if you would uh, like a little bit more information or if you'd like to be put in touch with either of us, then uh, send us an email and uh, we'll sort it out from there. Anyway, that's enough from me. And, and thank you again so much, Nabatuzu, for coming along and, uh, and sharing, your, sharing your experience. I hope you really enjoy the rest of your uh, project and, and hopefully see you back in Berlin soon. For sure. Thank you. Have a good evening, Lawrence. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.